Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's, uh, it's time for our final talk of part three um, by Professor Marina Silverini. The topic is about a tablet called Photonic in Continuum. Uh, let's uh, please uh, welcome Professor Silverini for, for his uh, speech. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and uh, thank you so much also for the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's uh, really a great pleasure uh, to, to do it. And uh, as you can see from the title, I'm going to talk about uh, topological organics. And uh, a good starting point is, I'll make, as a starting point, I'll make uh, a brief overview of some topological ideas. Uh, and uh, I'll start with uh, some concepts in the geometry of surfaces. So if you have a surface in the three-dimensional space, and we say that uh, two objects are topologically equivalent if we can deform one into the other uh, continuously. So for example, with this definition, we can say that this animation taken from the web, that we can say that the coffee mug is topologically equivalent to a torus, because as you can see, they can be continuously deformed one into the other. So it turns out that the topological classification of surfaces is relatively simple, and you can see it with your own eyes. So it turns out that two objects are equivalent if basically they have the, the same number of poles. So for example, all the objects in this line, they are equivalent because they have the same number of poles. So the number of poles, we, since any continuous deformation of the object must preserve the number of poles, we say that the number of poles Call it the genus is a topological invariant because it stays the same if you deform the object. Okay? So we say that the sphere has genus zero, a torus has genus one, and so forth. So in this case, this is a very appealing and intuitive concept. You can see the topological invariant by looking at the object itself. But sometimes we are interested in systems where we cannot visualize directly the topological invariant. So we have to do it in a different way. So usually what we do is to have, we have some quantity that we integrate. And actually we can make this connection also with this example that I'm uh, telling you. And uh, this genus is obviously a global pro property, depends on the number of poles. But uh, you can also define it in terms of a local property, something that depends, of, that you can see locally on each point of the surface. And so this property is the Gaussian curvature, tells you how much curved is the surface. For example, if you have a convex surface, it will have like a sphere seen from the outside, it will have positive curvature. If you have a concave surface, it will have negative curvature. Now, the interesting thing, and of course, you can deform your object and this curvature can change a lot. You can do bad things to your surface. But the interesting thing is when you integrate this Gaussian curvature over the entire surface, it turns out that the result is quantized. It's always a, an integer number, and uh, it gives you this uh, 1 minus g, so it, it depends on the number of holes. So basically, you can calculate this topological invariant, which in this case has a very precise geometrical meaning, using uh, differential, uh, using, uh, differential top, uh, in, in, by integrating this quantity. OK, let's see how this translates to uh, physical systems. And before moving to photonic systems, which is the focus uh, of this talk, let me first tell you a few words about electronic systems, because basically topological photonics was inspired by electronics. So let's first look at this example. And I want to consider a two-dimensional material that will be periodic. So it will be a two-dimensional <coughs> electron gas, and the electrons can flow in the x or y plane. So they can move along x or along y. And it's a periodic material. So we know that uh, the energy levels in such a system, they are described by the Schrodinger equation, and we know that the energy levels are organized in bands. So we have an uh, electronic band structure, this is the energy, this is the wave vector, and we have different bands. Now, I'm interested in a situation where uh, let's, we know that the electrons will fill the low energy levels, up to the Fermi level. So I'm interested in a situation where all the low, low energy bands are completely filled. So the balanced band is completely filled, 
and uh, the conduction band is empty. So we know from condensed matter theory, from basic semiconductor theory, if you want, if the energy levels are completely filled, we know that the material will be an insulator, which means that if you apply an electric field, there will be no transport of electric charge. So actually, this is not completely correct. Actually, it turns out that if this material is under the, under the influence of a very strong magnetic field, actually the conductivity, even though the, the, the advancement is completely filled, it turns out that the conductivity can be non-zero. And it turns out, if you do the calculation, that the conductivity for this material, these non-diagonal terms, is quantized, is given by this number, and in units of electron charge squared divided by Planck constant, it's an integer. So we get this interesting result. And this integer is known as the TKNN integer, by uh, after this, uh, these authors that discovered this. And it turns out that this integer is a topological invariant, analogous to the genies that I just discussed a few slides ago. So to further uh, explain these ideas, uh, it turns out that this, uh, uh, this integer uh, it's known as the Shen number, and it is expressed as an integral uh, of some quantity over a surface. So quite similar to the genies that was the integral of the Gaussian curvature, this one will be the integral of some quantity that is known as the Berry curvature. So this Berry curvature depends on the properties of your electronic system. So it will depend on the band structure of the electronic system, and you can calculate it. Okay? So this is basically the, the main ideas uh, behind uh, topological concepts uh, in electronics. And so the shared number depends on the global properties of the electronic structure. And only if you break the time reversal symmetry, so only if you put, for example, a magnetic field, a static magnetic field, only in this condition, this shared number can be different from zero, and the conductivity can be different from zero. And it's evident that in this case, this shared number has a precise physical meaning. It tells you how much is the conductivity. Okay. Okay. So let me tell you how we calculate in practice this shared number, so basically you have the electronic band structure and you can compute the stationary states of the Schrodinger equation, so basically you have to solve the Schrodinger equation, you get the band structure, and each state, since we assume that the material is periodic, each state is a block wave. So basically it can be seen as the product of the envelope, which I designate here as U, and the propagation factor. And uh, this uh, shared number is, uh, to calculate this shared number, we introduce this quantity, which is the very potential, which we write in terms of the envelope like this, uh, as it were to be the inner product of the envelope with derivative with respect to k for each wave vector, and then we have to sum over all the, the bands below the, the, the Fermi level, so over the blue bands, in this case it's a sum of two terms, and uh, this envelope must be normalized like this. So this is just the way it is done. And uh, then you define the Berry curvature, which will be the curve of the Berry potential. So after all this, you can integrate this quantity over the wave vector space, which is the Brillouin zone, and you get your shared number, your topological invariant, which determines the conductivity. Okay? So this is the, 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 the main ideas. And uh, one interesting uh, property of these uh, topological materials is that uh, we have just seen that uh, there are materials that have a band gap, so there are no electronic states in the band gap. And now imagine that you put two materials together, like what I illustrate here, and they share a common band gap. So in this band gap, they, there are no energy levels. Now you put them together. Because they have different shared numbers, because they have different topological invariants, it turns out, and this is one of the most important properties, that there will be uh, edge states, there will appear edge states which correspond to electronic states that propagate along the edge, uh, and usually they are unidirectional and they are gapless, which means that they go from the balance band to the conduction band, and because of this you can have a flow of transported electrons along the edges. Okay, so I'm done with electronics, so I'm moving to, to, to photonics now, and see that these concepts can be uh, translated in a more or less straightforward manner to the case of photonics. So in photonic systems, uh, photonic system, so basically the basic ingredient to compute shared numbers, uh, it should be more or less clear from what I discussed, is that you need the band structure. 
And of course, in photonic systems, you can have a band structure. You can have a photonic crystal, so you can have some dispersion of frequency as a function of k. So basically, frequency, of course, replaces energy. And uh, based on the analogy between light, propagation of light in photonic crystals and propagation of electrons in uh, materials, uh, Radu and Alden, they showed that actually we can compute square numbers for the case of photonic crystals. It that depends, of course, on the band structure of the photonic crystals. The formulas are pretty much the same. Well, there are some modifications that I will discuss. And uh, to have a non-trivial material, to have a non-trivial shared number, you need to break the time reversal symmetry, which means that your material should be non-reciprocal. You cannot use just normal dielectrics. Well, in this context, you cannot just use normal dielectrics or normal uh, metals. You need to break the time reversal symmetry, which means that usually you need to apply a biasing field or some other related solution. Okay, so this is the basics. And in this case, in photonics, the topological invariant does not have an immediate physical meaning, at least to my knowledge. In the electronic case, we think it determines the conductivity. But here, we don't have a conductivity for photons. You cannot apply an electric field that makes a photon move. So there is no immediate physical meaning. But this bull catch correspondence that I mentioned previously, when you put two materials that are topologically different, when you put them together, because they are different, there will be this propagating states along the edge. And this is basically, in, terms, in photonics, this is the main result. This is the main, the main uh, uh, thing that you get from these materials. And this was nicely uh, experimentally verified in this experiment uh, in 2009 by the MIT group. They showed that if you have a photonic crystal made of ferrite rods, and if you bias the photonic crystal, this material is topologically not trivial. You can calculate the shared numbers. Uh, 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 well, means, uh, applying the formulas. So here it's the band structure, and here you can see the shared numbers that they calculated. And now, if you put this material together to another material that is trivial, in this case, it's just a metal that obviously does not support propagation at the frequency, at microwave frequencies that they use. Basically, and this photonic crystal also does not support propagation at the frequencies that they use. Basically, because they are topologically different, there will be edge states propagating along the edge and along, uh, along here, so they put here an antenna, and these edge states are unidirectional, they can only go one direction, so basically uh, they have demonstrated that uh, there is this propagation. And uh, the nice and interesting thing is that if you put now an obstacle in the path of this wave, basically because there are, like here, basically because there are no other uh, scattering, there are no other propagation channels. The wave the only propagation channel that is available is along the edge. There are no bulk modes. Uh, both materials are uh, in a weak band gap, and there are no edge states in the opposite direction. So the wave has no option but just go around the obstacle and uh, uh, with no backscattering. So this is uh, quite exciting, and people were, of course, quite excited with uh, these results. And so topological photonics has received uh, a lot of attention in uh, recent years. So what I want to discuss here is, do we really need a photonic crystal? So these solutions, that up to, until recently, uh, all the solutions that you could find in the literature, at least the majority of them for sure, were based on photonic crystals. You need some periodicity. Uh, and uh, to, to have logical materials, you need some periodicity. But I want to ask the question, do we really need this periodicity? Can we get rid of the periodicity? And there are several good reasons to get rid of the periodicity. One of them is simplicity. It's much simpler to study wave propagation in a continuum with no granularity than, of course, in the photonic crystal. It's much more complicated the population of the shared numbers. It's terrible. Uh, you need to do, to do a lot of simulations, a lot of numerical simulations. Well, if you are in the continuum, you can do everything almost analytically, or most of the times even analytically. So this is a good reason. Uh, simplicity, and the motivation to ask this question uh, was this very, very, very nice work by uh, the group of Professor Ingeta, where they demonstrated something that it relates uh, in an obvious manner to the slide I showed previously, the experiment of the MRT group. They, they showed that if you have a plasma, a material with uh, negative permittivity, <coughs> and if you put it together to a material uh, to another material, but in this case, uh, 
uh, marketized plasma, for example, some genotropic material. Uh, both materials, they don't support propagation at this frequency at which they did this numerical uh, simulation. And if you put a source near the interface, there are unidirectional edge states that make the wave go around this very seamless path and with no backscattering, basically because there are no scattering, other propagation channels. It's the only option. The wave has no place to go if there is no absorption, no other channels. So basically you get this. So can we explain these results using some topological ideas? So this is the goal. And I'm going to show you that, yes, uh, not everything is for free. Uh, we need to do it carefully, but yes, we can explain it using topological ideas. So how can we do this? So before, uh, let me start with some notations, so just to, uh, that I can use later. So I write my those equations. Uh, like this, so basically I, I, I introduced these operators that uh, are 6 by 6 matrices so that the equations look more similar to the Schrodinger equation because otherwise, uh, it, because the topological photonics, as I mentioned, uh, is pretty much inspired by the results of electronics, so it, there's some analogy with the Schrodinger equation. So we write it like this this N operator is this, this uh, uh, differential operator that we write in terms of the curls, and this F is a six vector with components electric and magnetic field, and uh, uh, G is also six vectors with uh, six components by the other two, uh, two fields. So, uh, to connect, uh, of course, we need something else. I'm interested in continuum, uh, no periodicity, uh, and to connect the two materials, mm -hmm. to specify what, what type of material you have, uh, you need to specify the material matrix. So I'll consider the most general material that we can have in this context, or at least if you consider a local response, which is a bioisotropic material, which is characterized by this material matrix with six by six, with components determined by the permittivity, the permeability, and then the, these terms that determine the magnetoelectric coupling. And uh, with this, uh, and the nice thing of working with the continuum, is that the natural modes of the system are just the plane waves. So we can compute them very easily. And like in photonic crystals, which are block modes, and we have to resort to numerical methods and all these complications, here it's very simple. So most of the times we already even know these things. So this is the good news. So uh, we still have one obstacle uh, in front of us before we can do some actual calculations. Uh, we need to make an analogy with the Schrodinger equation to get the barrier potential, to define the barrier potential. And uh, to make this analogy, we can make it almost immediately. We can write the Maxwell's equations like this. Uh, if you define, if you, if you keep with the notation of the previous slide, if you define this time evolution operator that uh, is the analogous of the uh, Newtonian in electronics, if you write it like this, uh, you have uh, something that is basically the Schrodinger equation with uh, plan constant equal to work, right? And this is the inverse of the material matrix. But there is one problem, which is that this material matrix, for the cases of interest, which is always, uh, uh, depends on frequency. And this is quite different from the Schrodinger equation, where uh, the Newtonian does not depend on frequency. It just acts on the wave function at time t without depending on the, on the past, okay? But without depending on the Previous history. So we, get, we have to get rid of material dispersion. We have to go to one extra step. And uh, how do we get rid of the material dispersion? So basically what we do is we introduce additional variables into the system uh, that uh, will describe the dispersion. So to give you an example, if you have, for example, a plasma, this additional variable could be the velocity of the electrons and it would depend on space and time, so it would be a vector field. And basically, uh, what we pay, the, the price that we pay for this is that our dynamics will look more complicated, because then you have Maxwell's equations coupled to the dynamics of the, the internal degrees of freedom of the medium. And basically, the nice thing is that you can do it, whatever material response you have, you can prove that you can always do it. Maybe these variables don't have a clear physical meaning, but we don't have to worry with that. Actually, in the end, we'll not use them, so that's also the good news. But anyway, you can do it by introducing this additional variable skew. You get the more complicated dynamics, but now the nice thing is that there is no dispersion. So 
it looks exactly as the Schrodinger equation. Now, yes, it looks exactly as the Schrodinger equation. And so basically, now you are ready to, com to compute the topological uh, uh, invariants, and to compute the very phase and uh, the very uh, potential, and so on. So with the analogy with electronics, we could define the very potential like this, in terms of the additional variables. But the, the good news is that, in the end, after you work out all the details, you see that you don't need additional variables because you can write this quantity only in terms of the electromagnetic fields. So again, you don't need additional variables. It's just an intermediate step to justify it. And the final result is this. So a lot of sometimes it's simple because you don't need additional variables. And you can write everything in terms of only in terms of the electromagnetic fields and in terms of the material matrix. And if you can see that this here is the term that usually we use to compute the store of the energy in a lossless medium. So basically you get this nice formula. By the way, Raghu and Alden previously got something similar. I, I generalized it to the case of <coughs> pyrisotropic media and to the case of special dispersive media. Okay? So we get this. And it will be useful as you will see to have it for special dispersive media. <coughs> OK, so now we are more or less ready, because we have a formula to compute the Berry potential. Uh, and so we can define the Berry curvature like this. And then you have to integrate it over the wave vector space. And we get our shared numbers. So we are ready to uh, characterize uh, the topological phases of a material, say if it's trivial or trivial. And hopefully with that, to predict if we put materials together, we get edge states, topological edge states or not. So this is the idea. But Another obstacle. Uh, it's not so direct. So this is actually the real obstacle. Uh, the problem is that we can guarantee that this is an integer, the shared number, that is this theorem that guarantees that this is an integer if the wave vector space is a closed surface with no boundary. So if it's a photonic crystal, <laughs> this is guaranteed. Because in a photonic crystal, we are just propagation along x and y. And we know that in a photonic crystal, uh, the wave vector space is periodic, which means that kx is a cyclic variable, ky is a cyclic variable, so basically it's like a circle, and the wave vector space is the product of two circles, which is a torus. Okay? So it's a closed surface with no boundary. Now, in electromagnetic continuum, that's not the case, because the wave vector space is any kx or any ky, completely unbounded, so it's the Euclidean plane. So obviously it's not uh, it's not closed and obviously uh, does not satisfy the conditions of the theorem. We can kind of pretend that the problem does not exist, and we'll do that for a while. And we can even hide it under the rug, and it's not a problem, and say that we can map each point of the Euclidean plane into a point of a sphere using the stereographic projection. So you have the ribbon sphere. So you can say that rather than the Euclidean plane, you can say that your wave vector space is just a sphere, the surface of the sphere. So if you do that, of course, a sphere is a closed surface with no boundary. It kind of seems we solved the problem. But we didn't really solve it. We just uh, kind of uh, are uh, reading uh, under the rug. It will come uh, in, your, in our face uh, very soon. Uh, and we'll see what is the problem. But anyway, this is useful even in terms of visualization and even in terms of making analogies with the usual case. So finally, let me give you some example. And uh, I'll consider this genotropic material uh, with this type of dispersion. So for simple, so this could be a magnetized plasma. Uh, let me tell you that the magnetized plasma does not have exactly this dispersion, but I consider this for simplicity, just one pole. The magnetized plasma has like another pole. Uh, so we have this, so it would be the same as a magnetized plasma on Z, well, with this uh, conditions I mentioned, and I'm interested in propagation of x and y, and uh, it turns out, that, of course this is well known, you can split the wave propagation to TM waves and TE waves. So TE waves, they are not very interesting because they don't see the magnetic field, the binding magnetic field along Z, so we'll not get anything interesting from these ones. These ones are the ones that can be interesting for us, okay? So let me show you what we get with this very simple example, as simple as possible. And here I show you the band structure that you get, which you can compute uh, very simply. Uh, and for each band, I show you the shared number that you can compute with this theory that I outlined. 
So first let's look at T waves. T waves, as I mentioned, they are not interesting. Uh, the dispersion is the light line for this model that I used. And as expected, the shared number is zero. Okay, so they don't feel the magnetic field, so the shared number should be zero. There is nothing interesting here. Now, TN waves are the ones that are interesting because they feel the magnetic field. So they feel the non-reciprocal effects. And if you compute the shared number for the, these two bands, you'll see for that for the top band, this one, and the shared number is an integer. And actually, it can be plus or minus one. Depends on the sign of this parameter, which depends on the orientation of the magnetic field. So if it's up, for example, it's minus one. If it's down, it's plus one. So this one is fine. It's exactly what we want. But this one, if you notice, this one is not fine. The shared number is not an integer. You get this strange number. And it's definitely not an integer. Integer, and you need to be a, it to be an integer because otherwise you don't have any topological quantity. If it's a real number, you deform your system, and the real number is deformed. You want to have a quantity that you deform your system, you change the parameters of your material, and still the quantity stays invariant. That's why it's a topological invariant. So you need it to be an integer. So what is wrong? Why is it not working? So basically, it turns out I don't want to bother you with technical details. But the problem is uh, exactly the fact, well, it comes to, to, to the fact that our surface is not closed and bound, uh, it's not compact. Uh, but basically, if you want to compute the shared number, usually you can define the very potential uh, over all space. And in general, there will be a few singular points for a few wave vectors. For example, in the sphere, it could be these three points. The North Pole, which corresponds to K equal to infinity, the south pole corresponds to the origin, and hypothetically some other point. So usually for the examples I'm telling you, the singular points are only the north pole and the south pole. Just this two. And because the shared number is the integral of a curve, you can apply Stokes' theorem, and basically you can reduce the calculation of the shared number to an integral over these small circumstances, so around the north and south pole. Now the problem, and you can prove, that these integrals are always integer, as they should be, if your operator, if your Newtonian, is a smooth function of the wave vector. And it is a smooth function of the wave vector everywhere, except at the North Pole, because the North Pole is k equal to infinity. And so this is the problem. So this is the problem I mentioned previously. And so this is why we don't get, the, sorry, this is why we don't get the integer shared number. It's this problematic point, because the Newtonian is not smooth near infinity. So it seems the situation is hopeless. We cannot uh, maybe put to logical quadratics in continuous media. But actually, uh, let's look again at the results we found. OK, we understand this one is not an integer because of this problem. But at the same time, if you look at the other band, we got an integer. What, so why did it work so well for the top band and it doesn't work for the bottom band? So I tried to think why it was working for the top band. And actually, the explanation, again, I don't want to go into details, but basically the reason is that if you look at the top band, basically, uh, as k goes to infinity, so it would be going in this direction, this band, the frequency also goes to infinity. Okay? And so as you approach the North Pole, the problematic point for the top band, the frequency goes to infinity. So when the frequency goes to infinity, what is special about that? What is special is that the material response approaches the material response at the bottom. If you let omega go to, to infinity, the material should be equivalent to the vacuum by gram square. So this is the special uh, thing that happens. And if you can guarantee, guarantee that this happens always, every time you approach the North Pole, then you can guarantee that shared memory is integer, and then you can do some nice topological calculations. So this is the idea. So we can say that uh, a certain material is well behaved, if this should be uh, proportional. If near the North Pole, which means when k goes to infinity, uh, the, the material response is similar to that of the vacuum. Or actually, you can relax this condition and just say that it's similar mm -hmm. to the response of any reciprocal material. It's even simple. So if you can guarantee this, then you are, you are good. The, the shared numbers will be integer. So all the, but normal materials don't satisfy this condition. We've just seen that. So uh, how can we solve this problem? So what I propose is to introduce a special cutoff. So basically, the idea is to modify the material response slightly, specifically for large wave vectors, in such a way 
that's the permittivity rather than, so we replace the original permittivity, which is the vacuum term plus some susceptibility, and we put this factor here, which is the cutoff. So if k is like very large, basically this will kill the response. So with this, you can really fix the problem with this special cutoff, which can be arbitrary, and then you get uh, uh, really uh, materials that are well behaved in the sense I explained. So let me show you what we obtain with these modifications. So basically, you can choose different cutoffs, which are the different curves that we have here. So for example, if you have this large cutoff in these units, it would be this uh, uh, purple line. Without cutoff, it would be the green line. And you can see that for the base structure, it's essentially the same, except if you approach k equal to infinity, which is here. But the nice thing is, as soon as you put the cutoff, any value of the cutoff, immediately you can do some topological calculations, because the shared numbers become <coughs> integer as you want them to be. So immediately you can classify topological phases. So this is the main idea. So now you are ready uh, to apply this theory and to explain this result. I uh, outlined the beginning by the group of Professor Ingeta. So if you have a plasma and if you have a gyrotropic material together, we have just seen that if you put here a cutoff, it is a topologically non trivial material. A plasma is a reciprocal material, you always get shared number equal to zero, so if you put them together, there is a difference of shared numbers, so you should have edge states propagating along the boundary. And this actually happens, well, I'll skip this, this actually happens, and uh, so here I'm showing you frequency, wave vector, this is for propagation along this direction, and this is the band gap where you don't have uh, propagation in this material and also in this material, so this is the common band gap. This is the bug structure of the magnetic optical material, so we don't need it. And this is the edge state. So you see that we have edge states propagating along the gap, and they are unidirectional. In this case, they only propagate to the left, and they are gapless, okay, as they should be. So we get this example. And for other values of omega p, we get something similar. So we can have this book catch to respond us and uh, make it work. Well, there are some technical aspects I'm not going to discuss at all. Test time. If you are interested, you can ask in the end. But you can always ensure that this works if you do things properly. So I'll just mention this. So, uh, and of course, let me show you some animations. So if you have this situation I outlined, uh, if you put the two materials together, so this is the magnetoplasma, this would be the normal plasma, and you put here an antenna, and you excite the edge state, and this is what we discussed before. Basically, there are no other channels. It must go around until it gets, in this case, this is an absorber, so actually it's there, I think. And when it gets near here, it just radiated away. Another example, uh, the wave has no place to go, so it is forced to go around until it is absorbed or radiated or something else like this. Okay, so this concludes the first part of my talk. And now I want to discuss uh, something a little bit different. So I've been focused how you can compute shared numbers and how you can have unidirectional propagation with the uh, gyrotropic media and all these things. Now I want to discuss a different possibility. So it's nice to have unidirectional propagation, but uh, bidirectional propagation is also fine. We also like it, right? We sometimes we want to communicate in both directions. What we want to get rid of is a backscattering. So we want just the wave to go without being refracted. This is basically what we'd like to have. So I want to discuss this possibility. How can we do this? And I'll start with something very simple that connects with what I have been discussing. Uh, if you want to have bidirectional propagation with the solutions I've been discussing, there is a simple way to do it. It's just use polarization. And the idea is use depolarization, TM, to transport light to the left without backscattering, and use S polarization to transport light to the right with no backscattering. And how can we do this? It's simple. It's almost trivial to transport depolarization just to the left, just use the same gyrotropic material mm -hmm. as before. So just put a gyrotropic electric response. And now if you want to transport S polarization to the right, just play with mu. So just put a gyrotropic magnetic response in the permeability. Now I want one of them to go to the left, well, and there are uh, another one to the right. And to ensure this, I must be careful about this coupling in the geomagnetic response. So basically, to do this, I have to select this sign and this sign. They must be different. 
Otherwise, both go to the left or both go to the right. I want one to go to the left and the other one to the right. So I must switch signs. This has a physical implication. It means that the electric response, if you want to do it with a magnetic field, should feel a magnetic field that is the opposite of the magnetic response. So you need to have both electric and magnetic gyrotropic, and this should feel opposite magnetic fields. It seems impossible, right? So let's not worry about that for a while. It's for, for sure uh, very, very challenging. Uh, let's just see what we get first. So for this, tip, for this example that I'm shooting, I'm shooting basically epsilon and mu equal except for this sign. So the bun, the, the, the bun structure of the S and P polarized modes, they are the same, so you get this. You can compute the shared numbers, like uh, uh, I explained previously. And it turns out that because one of them goes to the left and the other one goes to the right, the shared numbers are symmetric for the two polarizations. So for P, you get, for example, plus one. For S, you get minus one. And all the idea is the same as before. Let's put this together with the topological retrieval material that does not support propagation at the frequency of interest for both polarizations. So here I pick an hyperbolic material that essentially has permittivity and permeability along z equal to 1 and permeability and permittivity in the xy plane negative. So basically I get this kind of structure, it's topological trivial, shared numbers are both, uh, are both identical to 0, and this is the edge states. And basically you get what you want, as expected, this is kind of trivial. So wave propagating to the left for p-polarization, one edge state, and wave propagating to the right uh, for s polarization, so another edge state. And they are totally uncoupled because it's different polarizations, it's trivial, so you don't have backscattering. And we can see this in a simulation. So here I choose, so this is the, 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 the plasma, so the trivial material, and this is the gyrotropic material with this epsilon and mu responses. And I'm exciting just as polarization, and of course, uh, there is only this channel, so the wave is radiated with no backscattering in the, to the right. So if I switch, uh, and if I put an excitation just of p polarization, then of course I get what I want, the wave propagates with no backscattering to the left, so it works. So this is uh, trivial almost. So let's make it less trivial and more interesting. So the first thing I'll do is these structures are intrinsically 2D, because I'm not worried about z dimension. I'm assuming z is infinite. So I want to make it less trivial, and the first step is to make it 3D. So to make it 3D, the idea is to cover this with some opaque material. It would be, for example, PC, PC. I would cover it. But I want to cover it in such a way that I don't destroy the topological properties of the system. And this is the challenging part. You should choose the cover in such a way that you don't lose any of these nice features. And actually, it turns out, I will not explain in detail how you come up with this theory. Today, I don't have this time. But it turns out that there is a way to choose the covers that guarantee that we don't destroy the topological protection. And for this system, one way to do it, it's not the only way to do it, but it's the simpler way to model numerical solver. So that I choose this simple way. I put PEC on the top and PMC on the bottom. And this way, I can guarantee, well, because this is protected by some symmetries that I will not discuss here today, I can guarantee that the topological properties are not lost. And this is not trivial anymore. Actually, the polarization is not anymore S or P. It's only these hybrid modes. And moreover, you cannot even compute it analytically. You have to solve the problem numerically. So this is not trivial. But it works. So let me show you some simulations. And uh, so here I have this gyrotropic material with back and PMC, top and bottom. And here I have this topological equilibrium material uh, with nothing special there. And I put an excitation here. So there are edge states propagating in both directions because the structure is bidirectional. But the important thing is that the way that is excited in this direction, and now both are being excited. My idea is a vertical dipole. It can excite states in both directions. And uh, the nice thing is that the wave that is radiated in this direction, you can see it goes around these strange obstacles with no backscattering. Nothing comes back. So we don't lose this nice property of having uh, propagation that is immune to backscattering. So this is the nice thing. And now let me put the same antenna, exactly the same antenna, in a different location. Now I put it here, and again it radiates in both directions. 
And now, uh, the nice thing is that when it is radiated in this direction, it just goes with no backscattering until it, it is absorbed here. This is an absorber and this is a, okay? So this is very nice. So we made a topological waveguide that is completely three-dimensional. Okay, but uh, still this is really difficult and really demanding. I explained in this thing that the two materials should feel symmetric magnetic fields. So how can we do this in practice? And moreover, can we do this without magnetic fields? And it turns out that the answer is yes. So we can get rid of these magnetic fields and just use normal materials, normal in the sense of reciprocal materials, with no, uh, with no, uh, uh, without magnetic fields. So how can we do this? So basically, to prove that we can do this, I will use duality theory. And you know duality theory. It just comes from the observation that in the Maxwell's equations, electric and magnetic field, they are essentially, they play the same role. So they are very similar. And there is this most common duality transformation that we all learned when we studied electromagnetics, is that if you replace in the Maxwell's equations E by H, H by E, and if you replace epsilon and mu, then you transform one problem into a new problem, but essentially the two problems are equivalent. So if there is interesting wave phenomena in the first problem, you have interesting wave phenomena in the second problem, and vice versa. So the two problems are equivalent. Now, this is the most simple duality transformation. Actually, you can use more sophisticated duality transformations. And the most general, almost there, uh, the most general duality transformation that you can consider is something like this. It's a transformation that will mix the fields. So the transformed electric field is a linear combination of the initial electric and magnetic fields. Something like this. OK, fine. And of course, the material matrix, the original medium, will also be transformed by the dual transformation. Now, uh, for this type of more general transformation, you don't just interchange epsilon and mu. It's much more complicated than that. I will not even write the formulas, but I'll write them symbolically, like this. So you get big confusion, and you mix all these things together, but you get a new material that essentially they are connected by a dual transformation. So the physics is quite similar in both cases. Now, first question. Can we transform a non-reciprocal medium into a reciprocal medium with a dual transformation? Because the physics will be the same, but being reciprocal and non-reciprocal is not definitely the same. It's rather different. So if you never heard of this, it may look surprising the answer, because the answer is yes. But actually, there are well-known examples. And this, perhaps, is the best well-known example. The Tellurian medium, this hypothetical medium, that is this bioisotropic uh, magnetoelectric coupling. It's well-known that you can get rid of this uh, Tellurian piece by doing the, uh, a non-trivial ball transformation. You can transform this material into this material, standard material. So this is a, an example that it, a non-reciprocal material can be transformed into a reciprocal material. But this is not interesting to us. Actually, you can show very simple, very quickly that, for example, the element material is always topologically trivial. Shared numbers will always be zero. This is not interesting. We will not get anything from here. So let's make a better question. Can we transform a gyrotropic medium, like the ones we've been discussing, can we transform them into a reciprocal medium? And surprisingly, it turns out that the answer is yes. So in some conditions, you can transform a gyrotropic material that can be topologically non-trivial, so this is a nice thing, into a material that uh, is reciprocal. And basically, it turns out, so basically, it should be in this form. And uh, epsilon is gyrotropic, so it can be written as uh, real part, it's this matrix. Mm -hmm. And then the, the imaginary part, it's written in terms of an antisymmetric matrix, like this. And now, if you choose carefully, and the, the permeability should be like this. So it's the transpose, and when you transpose, you switch the sign of the gyrotropic coupling, as it should be. And then if you choose carefully the duality transformation, it's not trivial, but it's not complicated. I didn't write it here because we don't need it. But basically, you can transform this medium into this medium, and this medium is reciprocal. Okay? This medium is not reciprocal. You need this strange coupling, but this one is reciprocal. And actually, it's a well-known medium. It's the omega medium. Okay? And so basically what we proved is that this omega medium is intrinsically equivalent 
to a xenotropic material. This is really surprising. That is topological. And first of all, how can you make this omega medium? So the omega medium has been very much well studied in different contexts, even in the topological context. I'm going to briefly mention that uh, right after. And basically, it can be done with inclusions that are omega shaped. It was first proposed, I, I think, by Professor Ingeta, and means very, very much studied by a lot of people. And uh, uh, so you can do it as a metamaterial. Now, let me mention that actually this omega medium has also been discussed in the literature in terms of effects rather similar to what I'm discussing here uh, in this article. So also in terms of topological transport of light and all these things. But uh, the difference from what I'm discussing here, this was relying on a photonic crystal, so it required some periodicity, and this design was purely 2D, at least to my knowledge. So what I'm going to show you next, it's a completely 3D design based on continuous media, so based on an electromagnetic continuum, uh, uh, and we got here based on the world transformation. So basically, application of the theory I explained is that if I have this nice structure, that I had before, that is topological, an isotropic dielectric, xenotropic medium. If I transform it with the duality transformation, then basically these guys stay the same. The pegs stay back, this one stays the same, this stays the same, but the xenotropic medium is transformed into omega medium. What does this mean? It means that this simulation, which is exact numerically, is exactly the same. So if you, here you have omega medium, if, if, if here you have the isotropic dielectric, if you put here the source, you still have this propagation bidirectional with no backscattering with a reciprocal material. So this is the main message. So to conclude, I have shown that uh, we can do some topological calculations even in an electromagnetic continuum. We can use this to classify different topological phases and to predict the appearance of that states when you put together materials that are not trivial. And uh, using uh, duality theory, we have shown that omega media are intrinsically equivalent to uh, a subclass of xenotropic material, and that this can be used to uh, transport light uh, with no backscattering. Thank you so much. A very impressive talk. Then now we have less than 15 minutes for questions and comments. Any questions, comments? Yeah, first, uh, thank you very much. And I would like to ask, of course, about the last uh, issue of your omega thing, which kind of behaves in one direction. So, but there is a process here for scopes, right? Excuse me? The reciprocity theorem is valid. I mean, it's a reciprocal system, right? It is a reciprocal system. So, let's see. And then, uh, if you allow maybe a couple of quick uh, comments, when you spoke about this uh, bidirectional thing without uh, complex scattering, yeah. I think you cheated a little bit because if you have some kind of inhomogeneity in scatters, which couples the two variations. Uh, no, no uh, actually, it's not any complex scattering in this scenario where we're just changing the wall of the. I mean, it's exactly what I'm showing. So if I'm not putting here new objects with different primitivities. That can create scattering, definitely. That's true. But if you are just deforming the walls, yeah, you can deform them as you wish, and you don't have backscattering. But I, what you're saying is correct. Yes, if you put okay. different objects there, you can put backscattering. Now, I'll ask you another very quick question. So, uh, I'm not sure about that device, but if I understand correctly, that device is one way, right? One way, exactly. Yes, so here what we are trying to do it is uh, to have bidirectional. So, the challenge is to make it bidirectional in no backscattering in, for both directions. Yeah, in your case, you are just, device, yes. your, your case is excellent, but it's, I think it's not different from the first examples where you just have one way propagation, yeah. right? That's what I mean to so yeah. And thing. you still need the bias field. So here yes, I, I show that with this solution, which by the way also connects with previous work as I mentioned by Kanadish uh, Gates and Alexander Kanakiev, that with Omega Media you can make it bi-directional. 
so we don't need the magnetic field. So this is the, the main point. Yes. 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 So thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, I was very curious about this first case with topological insulators. Because if I understand it correctly, you can change the geometry yeah. and it doesn't change the properties. But then you introduce this cutoff, which is like in a mathematical trick. Oh, the cutoff? Yeah. Yes. How does it work when you then deform the geometry? Because you enforce topology to make it a topology, yeah. topological ins insulator. So how does it work when you do this mathematical trick? Well, this mathematical, it's a mathematical trick, first of all, so that we can compute uh, topological invariance. And actually, it does not come for free, so I didn't actually have time to discuss it. Well, actually, maybe now it's a good time to do it. Uh, and uh, actually, you can guarantee that uh, all this, so the most important result that you want really to have in the end is the bulk catch correspondence. So that if you say that this material is topologically not trivial, you would like to be sure that if you put it next, to another material that is topologically trivial, you want to say there will be an edge state that is unidirectional. Because if you cannot do this, it's useless. You can't use this for anything, right? And uh, actually, uh, the fact that you put this uh, uh, cutoff is a very important uh, uh, thing. You really need the cutoff to be there. Also, when you compute the edge states, you need to be there to ensure that there are these uh, really uh, book, that the book edge correspondence works. If you don't put the cutoff in the material response, you cannot ensure it. So actually, in practice, I didn't discuss this because I didn't have time, so I have it here in the back. But, uh, in practice, to make it work completely, you need to, to do something like this. So you can emulate this cutoff that does not exist in the real material response to emulate this. What you need, have to do is to put here a small air gap in between the two materials. So basically, you mimic this in a real system by putting an, an air gap. If you don't put this air gap, in general, it will not work. So basically, we don't, it's a trick. We have to put it there, and then to connect with the real physical system, we need to do this. Otherwise, so things will not work. That's also what's simulated with the air gap. Yes, the air gap plays the role. Why the air gap? Because the cutoff makes the response of this material similar to air, as k goes to infinity. And so basically, we put the air gap with so very small thickness. It's the reality. Say it again? So it's a reality behind it. Yes, yes, of course. You need to take into account. Otherwise, since we'll, I can show you an example. For example, here, if you don't put the air gap, and if you put the two materials together, you don't get these states here. But after you put the air gap, so after you put the air gap, you start having the edge state. So with the air gap, it would be this black line, for example. You get the edge states. Without the air gap, you would not get anything. And by the way, these green lines is like the exact solution of the problem, taking into account the cutoff. So basically, it's like a specially dispersive material, and you are taking everything into account. So when you really have the cutoff and model everything self consistently, you get unidirectional edge states. If you don't do that, you don't even have edge states. If you put the air gap, you can mimic it. So this is the yes. One more question. What about losses in this case? Yes, I didn't consider loss uh, in any of these studies. Well, actually, some CST simulations have some loss there. But uh, I just wanted to see what is possible to do. I was not focused in uh, the effect of loss. But of course, loss is an important effect. Yes. But do the same exist with these numbers? or Say it again? Do you get the same with these integer numbers? Or do I don't know. But actually, to compute topological numbers, you must assume there is no, to my knowledge, you must assume there is no loss, otherwise you can do it. That's one of the reasons we don't consider what I am not considering loss. But in real systems, Thanks. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So uh, essentially, you, you, you do your topological analysis based on a chair number and very coverage populations. And this is plus for two dimensional systems. Yeah. And uh, for instance, when you do duality transformation, yes. the transform system, you can apply the same chair number analysis and you will get the same topological number, or you just trust the original system? Uh, duality transformation preserves the chair numbers, any duality transformation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, also, uh, for, for a chronic system, there is a classification with uh, many different topological numbers yeah. and different classes. Yeah. So you should have uh, binary also symmetry and also particle fold symmetry. Yeah. So can you have something similar in terms of analysis for photonics, continuous photonic systems? Yes, so I, put, I didn't even discuss it today, but I, I published uh, an article where I, uh, this article here, where I showed that you can have this D2 classification for time reversal invariant materials. But uh, uh, yes, so you can classify different topological phases if you assume from the beginning that the materials are reciprocal. But in general, in photonics, you don't have this nice property that you have in, because time reversal operator is different. So you don't have this nice property that it's protected against backscattering in photonics, in general, if you just consider general system. And the second symmetry, the like particle fold type symmetry, doesn't exist in photonics? Uh, I cannot say. Okay, you. Effective medium parameter epsilon depends on uh, wave vector, and uh, uh, does it cause uh, spatial dispersion? I mean, propagation of additional modes. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. That's true. And how many? Uh, yes, actually, there is, there, this was also part of this discussion. So, if you consider everything. Well, you, you basically, you can take, out, take care of the special dispersion by introducing a, a new field. And after you work out all the details, you see that you have actually three modes, not just one mode, you have three modes. Mm -hmm. And you have to use additional boundary conditions even to solve it. So actually, you have to use four additional boundary conditions. So you can solve everything self-consistently. This is what more theoretical interest, because in practice, the cutoff is not there. So this is just for for our theoretical understanding, if you want. But uh, the important point is that we can mimic the cutoff with the air gap. And, and it works see, fairly well. It's not perfect, but it works fairly well. Do we see them in uh, numerical simulations? Or no? You does, mean? Does it uh, occur in numerical simulations or not? So I did this analytically. When you have this, uh, this cutoff, I did it analytically. You just have one edge mode. I don't know if, uh, so for example, with the so but this is an example. If you take into account the special dispersion with additional boundary conditions and everything, you have exactly one edge mode to propagating at the interface. But to complete this edge mode, you have to match the waves in the two in the two regions and you need this all these additional boundary conditions. And okay, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca.